for the past three years, we've been working on this painting, A Village Fair by Peter Bruegel, the Younger. The work really invites us in. It's got a lot of fine detail and that makes you want to stand really close to the work and you start to see the details that are there. And then you start to see the sort of bawdy content in the work. But it's not just that level of humour and rudeness that I think holds you there. You start to see that it's really talking about morality and vice and about violence and about charity. And the whole work is just, it gives you a real sense of balance between these forces of human nature. Peter was the eldest son of Peter Bruegel the Elder. Peter Bruegel the Elder was one of the most important Netherlandish artists of the 16th century. He died quite young and left two sons, one of which is the artist of our work, Peter Bruegel the Younger, and Jan, who also became a very influential artist of the next age. The first step in any conservation project is research. In the research library we have here at the Auckland Art Gallery, there's a set of archives which tells us about the history of the work since its acquisition into the gallery collection. So what have we got in the Auckland Art Gallery archive on a village fair? This is one of many scrapbooks we've got, which were newspaper clippings that were collected over the decades related to the gallery. Um, we had a look in here and then 16th of March 1961, it first appears in the New Zealand Herald. The art gallery hangs its new pictures. There's a few clippings that reference it, but this one, um, which was in the Auckland Star on the same day, says major purchases lift city gallery standard. <laughs> <laughs> Colin McCann, the famous artist who was working at the Auckland City Art Gallery, was acting director. So there's also correspondence between him and the McKelvey Trust, who give him the go ahead to purchase the painting on their behalf. We then see later on in 1961 um, correspondence with other art historians, um, people working in art history institutes trying to authenticate it and um, find out more about the different versions. And then finally we're just going to show this as well, the Auckland City Art Gallery Quarterly, which was a journal published by the gallery from 1961 and it shows the village fair um, on the cover um, and inside talks a little bit about the provenance of it. I think it'll be a real treat for um, people to have seen it at the time as well. I know when I first saw it on the, in the McKelvey Gallery um, a few years back, it's just there's so much to look at and I've always loved his work. So it's, yeah, personally, I think um, it's still of huge significance to the gallery. Another technique that we used to analyse his painting was SEM with EDX. So using this technique at Auckland University, we're able to look at the elements present within the pigments that are in the paint in the artwork. And that enables us to also date the work because over time, artists use different pigments or different palettes. And this changed as technology developed, um, as different regions opened up to the world. And you tend to get uh, distinctive palettes within different time periods. So that's the picture of it and then you can see that corresponds with that bit there. So we're just going to zoom in on that. A scanning electron microscope is like a really fancy camera that can see minute detail. We're looking at paint chips one or two millimetres in diameter but we can actually get information from materials that are probably one thousandth of that size as well if we needed to. Anything that's more atomically dense looks brighter. So these bits will be heavy and they're probably lead, right? Yeah. yeah. And these are, this is the bit that we're interested in. So we're only analysing in that area. EDS stands for Energy Dispersive Spectroscopy. And it's a method where you can identify elements in, say, the top micron of a material. When you what we call excite an atom, it can lose electrons from one of those inner shells. And so the shells are the inner shell is the lowest energy and then they get higher energy as you go out. So you're inclined to lose an electron most likely from the lowest energy shell. It has to make the universe right and it will fill up from an outer shell. So you measure the energy loss as that of 
electron is going from one shell to another. And so that's what we see on the screen. The red lines represent an energy loss as an electron degrades. It's pretty um, specific for each element. So it's picking up copper and molybdenum or sulfur. Sulfur and molybdenum sit in the same place, so you just kind of got to have an idea of which one it's likely to be. Sulfur. Sulfur, yeah. And should we look at the lead too? That area of the year is just mainly showing lead and carbon and a bit of oxygen. That's a lead peak. Just lead's got lots of electrons, so it has lots of transitions. Yeah, and what this is confirming for me is that we've got a lead white pigment rather than a zinc white or another element making up the white pigment. Another analytical technique we used in the analysis of this work was dendrochronology. So we we're able to look at the tree ring growth on the edge of the panel and that enabled us to provide a calendar date for the execution of this work. So what we're looking at here is a section of the panel. This is panel four on the left side. And to help you, this is on the top here is the paint layer um, of, on the actual painting itself. And then underneath here is the, ba the back or the rear of the painting. And this is a support. What we can see here are the growth rings of the panel. So each one of these represents a season's growth. This is the um, going from the innermost area towards the outer part of the tree. So dendrochronology is the study of trees and time. So what we're interested in often is finding out what's happened in the past. So understanding environmental conditions and how they have changed through time. And so the width of the annual ring reflects those environmental signals the tree has received. So in a good year, when the tree has had lots of things that it needs, it will add a wide ring. And in a poor year, when the tree is quite stressed, the rings will be narrow. So we get a unique growth pattern. Now the beauty of this is that we can end up building these super long records that go back for hundreds or thousands of years. So the longest tree ring record from the Northern Hemisphere, I think is over 12,000 years long. So here in the Bruegel painting, it meant that we could measure the ring widths um, and then match that pattern against ring width series from other paintings and uh, what we call master chronology, so an average of many hundreds of samples. So this is a diagram that shows the length of the tree ring sequences from the five panels in the Bruegel painting. And panel PB is the um, Bruegel, and then panel one and panel five were identified as being so similar that they are from the same tree or from the same board. Uh, we can see that it goes from 1470 to 1598 is the last growth ring on there, after which time the tree was cut down. This one was a much older tree when it was cut down. It goes right back to the 1360s. And the nice thing about panel two and panel three is that they retain the sapwood rings. So the sapwood rings are from the outer part of the tree. So like on this board here, this is the heartwood. This is on an oak from Auckland. And this is sapwood. So the sapwood rings are still open. If we have sapwood present on something like the panels, we can then do a calculation on how many sapwood rings we would expect a tree to have. So we can determine from that a window of time in which the tree was probably cut down. We can see for panel two, um, it was cut down probably after 1604 and by 1628 at the latest. The results were in a sense what we would expect given that the paint, you know, the, the authenticity of the painting. But for me, it's always a surprise when you get a calendar date. It's like, yay, it works. <laughs> the painting is not just what's on the front. The painting involves other stories to do with the trade in timber, the production of timber. It involves narratives around how the pigments must be made. Um, so what you're doing is building a more complete understanding of the, the whole object 
and also the social context of the time in which it's made. So we can look at it in awe, but we can also look round the back of it and find there's something equally interesting or on the sides too. <laughs> As part of the research, we look at the artwork in great detail, so microscopic detail. So we already had a signature in the centre, but it was a bit clunky and maybe didn't quite look convincing. When we looked at under strong light and magnification, we found a really small signature in the corner where Bruegel typically signs his works. It's only three millimetres high and only about this long. <laughs> so it was really hard to see. It's still very hard to see because it's also quite damaged in that corner. But it's really exciting not only to have that signature, but to have a date after the signature. And we can see that it says 16 one something. So we now have a pretty firm idea that this painting was made in the 1610s. The signature that I found has probably been hidden for hundreds of years and it's just by chance that we found it again, which is quite exciting. I think if you live with something for long enough you tend to maybe forget about its flaws and this work has been on display since 1960. When it came into the conservation department it had quite a lot of thick degraded varnish on the surface. As varnish degrades it becomes quite yellow and kind of obscures the details of the work. So the blue sky had actually gone quite green and the trees were looking very drab, almost like it was an autumn and night time rather than a summery daytime scene. As well as the varnish over the surface we have these splits running through the work. They're actually where the five different panels, which were well, planks of wood, which make up the entire panel are joined. And everywhere that they're joined, there was retouching over top of them. So it looks like in the past, the panel was taken apart and then put back together again, but not very well. So wherever it was put back together, there was a little bit of a step or an overlap. And where that occurred, someone had come along and scraped the top layer off the artwork in order to create a level surface again to retouch over. And that's where you see these strong lines running across the work. So what we're looking at here is the back of the painting and you can see what we call a cradle, which was applied probably in the 19th century, maybe early 20th century. You can also see some of the original dowels which held the painting together and the only reason you can see that is the painting was thin quite significantly when this crate was applied. I think it's always nice to look at the back of the painting because you get a greater sense of the history of the artwork if you think about all the components that go into making it, not just the image on the front. We did talk and discuss about removing the cradle Removing a cradle would be a treatment that would require quite a lot of intervention, so it was decided that we would keep the cradle in place and look to improving the surface of the image. In terms of the conservation treatment, the first task was to remove that degraded varnish that was on the surface of the work. So upon removing that varnish, we also found there were parts of the painting that had been deliberately covered up. So these were the ruder parts of the composition. They include the woman here who's dancing, exposing her backside. We have a man urinating here. We have a man defecating and we have a rooster and hen in the corner there. They're obviously mating. In the work before it had the varnish removed, you couldn't see the bottom, you couldn't see the man here. This man appeared to be wearing trousers and we didn't have the hen at all. So the next step in the conservation of this work was then to retouch over wherever there were losses, which means putting very small dots of paint, trying to mimic the surrounding area. What was really exciting about doing the retouching on this work was having the six other versions in different galleries across the world. So I was able to contact those galleries and get high resolution images of those works. One example of that is say the, the dog here. So before treatment, you can see that there's just a, quite a dark mass in this area and a split that runs through the dog's face. And using 
the um, work from one of the copies, I was able to give that dog a new face that was um, very similar to one of the original Bruegel dogs. This painting depicts an imaginary village somewhere in the Netherlands. It's actually not painted as a piece of artwork from 1610. It actually is more like a historic artwork looking back to a simpler time. So this work would really be a kind of nostalgia piece for the people who were buying it. What you can see in the centre of the work is a farce or a play and it depicts the scene of a woman in adultery. Her husband is actually hiding in the basket behind her. This is the centre of the scene, but the scene is actually meant to be about the religious procession, which you can see over in the far right, where the saints, St. Hubert and St. Anthony, are being paraded towards the church. But you'll notice that not many people are actually paying much attention to the religious procession. They're far more interested in the drinking and the gambling and the dancing. The scene is incredibly lively. It's there's a lot to look at. As someone said to me, once you get a lot of bang for your buck looking at this work. As well as understanding the materials used to make the work, we also look a little bit at the social history and the context in which this painting was made. Peter Bruegel the Younger did a lot of copies of his father's work, but this is not one of those. It's actually a copy of his father's friend, Peter Bolton. So this was probably copied from an engraving, so it is a reverse copy of the composition. Peter Bruegel the Younger made about six copies in his workshop of this work, so it was obviously a really important composition for him, and it probably sold quite well to the merchant classes. There's an original by Balton sitting in the Rijksmuseum in Amsterdam, dated to around um, 1570. And we know that Peter Bruegel the Younger has made a few significant changes to the picture when he adapted it uh, some 40 or so years later. Um, and so he has taken out some of the well-dressed people in the picture, which we think were originally portraits of Peter Balton's and his wife. And in the time before mass production, Peter Bruegel the Younger really was um, producing his father's paintings and the paintings of Peter Balton's on an industrial scale. It's really extraordinary to think about. And um, there were particular techniques that helped this to happen. And one of them was to use tracings or line drawings of an original composition um, and to um, transfer those drawings onto a prepared panel using black chalk sprinkled through tiny little piercings on the, on the upper tracing that leaves a ghostly shadow of the composition on the fresh panel. Now this produced some extremely accurate results and so for that reason uh, you can go into museums in Europe, the Fitzwilliam, the Rakes Museum and you can find very close versions. We have used this occasion of cleaning the picture and restoring it to have it properly housed in a period frame. And we did this with the help of not only the conservator who worked on the painting, but also the McKelvey Society, which is a team of philanthropists and art lovers here in Auckland who helped to pay for the frame. So we're very, very pleased to be actually showing this painting in um, a suitable frame, which is oak, handmade, um, and what they would call a carpenter's style frame uh, that one can date to around 1610. It's been an incredibly rewarding project to work on. I really hope that the people of Auckland come back in to see this work again now that it's been restored. I think the discoveries that we made are incredibly important to our understanding of the work and what the artist was intending for us to learn and to appreciate about a human society. And I think that's part of why this work is still so relevant to people today because it really speaks to human nature.